look at how tiny he is. Obviously, objectively, if some guy is losing a whole bunch of lean mass, but he's still involved enough to at least retain muscle, like it doesn't take that much weekly volume to retain tissue if you're natural. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring you into the world of weightlifting a little bit. Yeah. Because I don't know that you've ever really been involved in, in the world of weightlifting. And when I say weightlifting, I mean Olympic weightlifting. Um, and there's one, there's a couple guys in particular that I want to talk to you about. Have you heard of Lu Zhaozhen? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. he's like one of the most prevalent guys on the internet, probably him or Klokov or even Clarence Kennedy, mm -hmm. who's not even a competitor, but he's a good friend of mine as well. This is what we know Lu Zhaozhen to look like. Mm -hmm. You said this was like 10 years ago or something? Yeah, but it's like kind of what his physique ends up looking like because he's hitting similar numbers uh, or he hit similar numbers in Tokyo. So uh, you can see this is like everyone loves him he's jacked. He's one of the most prolific weightlifters currently. And then if we look at his Instagram comparing oh, yeah. the back, right? A lot of people made videos about this stark, stark difference. I mean, you can see him. He's back squatting. I don't even know what weight uh, he's back squatting here. It's maybe not even 150 kilos. Like, look at how tiny he is. And then if we we can go to, like, just a video of him when he was absolutely in peak shape, right? Just, like, jacked out of his tree. And that's a, that's a Derekism right there. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you my thesis on it. Basically, what happens to a lot of people who are, like, very big weightlifters is they take a ton of time off after the Olympics. They kind of get the Olymp post-Olympic blues. They take time off, and he took over a year off. Mm -hmm. um, also, the pandemic in China has been pretty crazy. I, I heard this from somebody who lives there, and also you can see it on the news. So training and even just like getting adequate amount of food is tough. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not the same case for somebody with as high status as Lu Zhaozhen. Yeah. But drugs also become a factor in this. Yeah. And so I, what I want to know is like, what would be your take on this? Like, I would need to look way, <laughs> way deeper to give like a cursory even assessment. Obviously, objectively, if some guy is losing a whole bunch of lean mass, but he's still involved enough to at least retain muscle, like it doesn't take that much weekly volume to retain tissue if you're natural. Like, so, but if if you, but what if you're taking gear, you go off gear, and then you want to retain that muscle? It's probably a lot harder. Oh yeah, for sure. You can't do minimum effective. Well, if you were just cruising on something, it's super easy to hold tissue, like way easier than a natural. You can get away with. Not very much of anything, yeah. realistically, as far as training volume goes. And um, it's tough to say, though, without knowing, you know, the time frames, how much, what his weight was before and after, seeing actual shots in the exact same lighting and circumstances and whatnot, seeing how his lifts have gone up and down proportionally to where his physique looks at the time of looking smaller or bigger. So basically, like, just to show you how prolific China is, this is the men's side. These are all the world records. Mm -hmm. You can see the Chinese men team, men's team, like, really, really dominates. And then the women's team, you can see it's just China, 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 all the way through. Now, of all of those world records, we can hardly ever find a positive uh, dope test. Mm -hmm. And something you had mentioned on Rogan last time, not this time you were on Rogan, was the potential for a animal cholesterol-based testosterone. testosterone where yeah. It's like, would would that be something that the Chinese would take, or uh, like how can how could it be possible to to be able to have this prolific of a weightlifting team? Um, and pass that many tests. I'm not going to conflate, is it possible to be doing this with that's why they're successful? Right, but right. Synthesized testosterone in a lab from soy, like I'm, you can absolutely use animal grade cholesterol and derive it down the same way you would have, it's called steroidogenesis in your body, is like how your body takes cholesterol and breaks it down through a bunch of different enzymatic processes down to the actual molecule testosterone, and then have whatever amount of anabolism your body deems necessary to reach whatever functions that require is required of testosterone with um, the plant derived uh, testosterone that is found commercially. Like there is a carbon isotope ratio test that you would fail in general, if you were going to be using synthesized testosterone in a lab. However, if you had a chemist working for you or you were looking to, you know, skirt around the system, it, it's not even something that you can really pick up with current testing. 
because you could otherwise fail a basic steroidal module where you have like a T to EPT ratio that is out of whack. You get a red right. flag. If you get subsequently iso carbon isotope ratio tested, you need to fail that to have a, like you have failed. You need to have like an affirmative test on the carbon isotope ratio. And if you pass that, then it's like, well, where do you go from there? Yeah. Are you going to prove that this, this cholesterol derived testosterone is mine versus from somewhere else? Like you need more intricate elaborate testing that I don't know to be developed yet. So, uh, there also is like a half-life for the current typically used testosterone that can clear your system in a certain amount of time. Um, but then would a carbon isotope test be able to detect it even then or? Well, you could get around the basic screenings of the steroidal module through manipulation of timing, dosage frequency, ester, if any, administration, uh, modality, you know, if you're going to do a intramuscular versus subcutaneous versus fucking IV, like who knows? Mm -hmm. It depends on how fast the drug is going to get into your blood and metabolized out. And then there are things people do to increase the metabolism of drugs and enhance that. Um, but the, the ester itself and the choice of it, like the studies I've seen, even using enanthate, which is a relatively long ester, like there are certain individuals that could pass basic uh, testosterone to epitestosterone ratio assessments with using like fairly significant doses of test based on just lackluster uh, scope of the test to be able to, because they have to have it insensitive enough that it doesn't false positive people, right? but also sensitive enough that it catches people. So you have like this weird middle ground they try to play and that's why they have the steroidal module to assess fluctuations and if they see a weird fluctuation, even if it's within this more like vague range, they can kind of dial in a more narrow assessment of, okay, this looks weird for you, maybe not for the right. next guy. And that's just assuming that they're using drugs that would be, I mean, the, and by I say them, it could be anyone in the world. Are there, are there currently drugs available that, or, or suspected to be available that could, you could pass a WADA test with? There are a lot of drugs that just aren't on the list yet that are like again when it comes to designer drugs and the synth synthesis of them um yeah like oftentimes as far as i know wada is looking at research pipelines to get ahead of ahead of things to make sure they have stuff on their list that could otherwise be ergogenic in some capacity even if it hasn't been approved by the fda for like a clinical application yet like they have a lot of research chemicals on their banned substance list but a lot of times there is, you know, analogs or things that are somewhat the same, but not quite the same as this right. other drug. And those have not made it to the list. I mean, it's, I think a lot of people are going to see this the wrong way. And me saying like the Chinese are winning everything. They must be on drugs. It's like, mm. well, there's, that's weightlifting. So everyone's on drugs. It's just mm. that they are notoriously never caught. Yeah. Right. And like, so I hate, again, it's, it's like, it draws that parallel immediately. Like. <laughs> Well, they got to be doing some sort of drug or some sort of – they could be outworking, and that's what a lot of people say. They're working harder. They're better. They're just better. Their system is better. That's true. I think their system is better. Their process is better. Everything is better. But there has to be some way for some guy to be getting popped and or, – or to be getting popped or not getting popped. I guess – I like to think that there's a lot of protection around their athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, in the well, you've done a good job of talking about some of the corruption and political yeah, stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's that's primarily what I'm interested in. But I think a lot of people, they conflate what I'm saying with America not on drug, everyone else on drug. Uh, America good, everyone yeah. else bad. When, when the only reason I know about American drug testing is because I was involved in the sport and I know so many people and that, that are in, at least for weightlifting, they're in the testing pool yeah. and it's rigorous and it's brutal. Mm -hmm. Like USADA wants to catch Americans where I can't say the same is happening in China or other countries. Like they're, they're not just like, like you saw, it's like USADA versus everyone. Yeah, like it's tough to expect there to be the same level of scrutiny globally when you have to – it's not the detriment of an organization where they don't literally have stations within a country that's across the fucking planet, you know? Like you have to outsource the guy who's going to randomly show up, mm -hmm. and he has to be trustworthy. 
within your organization, even if he doesn't belong to your organization, like you might be hiring somebody that is endorsed by, you know, USADA, but isn't like literally, you don't have like USADA people parachuting into fucking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I guess like the internal drug testing Mm -hmm. in other countries, like I don't know that it's up to standard with USADA. And that is not to say, by the way, guys, I always have to disclaim these things because it's just like comment after comment is going to pile in. That's not to say that there aren't drug users in America. Like this is factual. These things have been covered. There are plenty of drug users in America who have gotten around the system, who have been on the fit. Like USADA has been favored or the governing body, the NGB of whatever sport they're playing, they have been treated favorably. That's not what I'm saying. What I've realized in weightlifting specifically is that USADA wants to catch people, okay, within the United States. Is there an organization in China that wants to catch Chinese athletes before they even go out to to WADA? I can't say the same is true. And if there was, they would get those results and they'd be like, we'll just keep those on the down low for now. Um, But I guess, like, if you were to try – if you had a lab – Right. If you had a lab and you had a team of athletes that you wanted to pass drug tests, that you wanted to uh, just maximize as much performance as you could out of them, what would be your process? Uh, fuck. For like what sport? For like weightlifting. weightlifting. Let's say weightlifting. Yeah. Like I would be looking for things that would enhance force production with a relative lack of increase in body weight. Like presumably there is like weight categories that we're trying to adhere to mm-hmm. and we are trying yep. to be mindful of that. Um, like it, it kind of depends on like, again, if the scrutiny is as exists within the banned substance list and like yes. what you can do. Let's say, let's say you're just, you got a team and you got a lab and you just get to work. And you got the, the the pharmacology. I would be looking for drugs that can really enhance like motor unit recruitment mainly. So mm-hmm. it would be like more on the neurological side than the trying to stack huge amounts of size on. And obviously a lot of that stuff is detectable. Um, off the top of my head, as far as like in versus out of competition testing, like I'm more, I typically follow UFC more than Olympic testing. Okay. So sometimes I have to refresh myself on what the actual standards are. Mm-hmm. But like, for example, even in, fighters you're allowed to use amphetamines for example out of competition all the way up until fight day essentially like there are certain things you could be doing from the neurological side that even just following the the outlines and stipulations given the leeways that exist within the organization like maximizing those that you might not even know exist right yeah the the amphetamines one exists across usada and wada i believe okay so you can use them out of competition they can't be de- – even if you do use them out of competition and they're detected in competition, you can still get popped, I feel. Hmm. But I feel like the, the half-life on those is hard or whatever. Sorry to interrupt. No, no worries. I guess, I guess actually then uh, with drug tests in mind, so it's like a, a two, twofer, right? Like what drugs would you take and how would you get away with it? Or, or sorry, give, take, whatever. I just think it's an interesting thought experiment because like – I think people need to know what they're up against. Let's say, let's say for fighting, yeah, not like, weightlifting. Like in general, the biggest leeway right now is in the bioidentical compounds. So that's things that you would normally produce because it becomes very difficult to discern between what is supposed to be there versus not supposed to be there. So you get this massive leeway, not massive, but like far more substantial than you would with a synthetic drug that's never supposed to exist. Mm-hmm. So if you have like, if you're comparing. Winstrel versus test, it's like, is Winstrel ever supposed to be there in your body at any quantity, even a micro amount? No. So it's like, <laughs> even if you have like a micro spec of it, you're going to get fucking pinged. So yeah. if you have test though, it's like, oh, well, I guess you fall within this cutoff, but do you have like a uh, UGT 2B17 enzyme problem or like a uh, deficiency whereby you can uh, metabolize drugs differently than the next guy or lack thereof? So you have a different T to EPT ratio. And then from there, you know, do we carbon isotope ratio test you or did you fall within our parameters that we didn't even follow up and try that because it was out of our budget because we're not going to do that with every athlete. Right. So like in general, I think the bioidenticals have the most leeway and is probably what is uh, the lowest hanging fruit if I was to identify something. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, press here for the full length episode.